two-minute warning. Two-minute warning turned into a two-second warning. <laughs> it's mixture. Wow, it looks like one. Uh, yes, I won't repeat the rest. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to call the March 14th meeting of the Commission, Indiana Commission for Higher education meeting to order. I'm pleased and uh, honored to be back at the chair's position after not having done so for a few years. Uh, but we have a perfect storm of, uh, no pun intended, uh, issues going on. We've got our three current officers are all off in different parts of the world. And, and as you note, uh, our wonderful uh, and capable commissioner, Teresa Lubbers, is unfortunately home uh, with a really bad case of the flu. And so we uh, are going to move along without her. Uh, we've got just enough for a quorum. Uh, and we'll get started with that here in a moment and, uh, and move through our meeting. I will also note before I introduce uh, Chancellor Paydar uh, to welcome us, I will note some of you may be aware that there's some weather in and around uh, Indiana. Uh, and there's a number of tornado watches uh, going on right now and some high winds that are coming. So be aware that uh, the weather situation is being well monitored and lots of different bells and whistles will go off if we need to uh, adjust our schedule. So with that, Chancellor Nassar Paydar, uh, we want to wel have you uh, welcome you and thank you for welcoming us. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted on behalf of 30,000 faculty students uh, of IUPI and uh, as well as 8,000 faculty staff of IUPI to welcome all of you to, uh, to this campus in a year where we are celebrating our 50th anniversary. We are delighted that you're having your meeting here. I'm also delighted that uh, you gave us an opportunity during lunch to talk with you about the campus and have a dialogue there. So I'm not going to take any time here uh, except to welcome you and wish you an outstanding weather and I make sure that there is no tornado coming here. I'm going to watch <laughs> out there. Thank you. Thanks. Now that's a strong leader when he takes charge of everything, including the weather around us. So we very much appreciate, Chancellor Paydar, your hospitality as always and your staff. Uh, you always treat us so well. We had a wonderful lunch and a great discussion. It was really interesting for us to hear updates on uh, in this 50th year of the IUPUI campus. Uh, it was great to hear all the positives uh, going on here and, and across the state. So we really appreciated that, that thoughtful discussion and thank you for having us. Um, I am, I guess, Mike, can I ask a favor of you? you Would you mind being our secretary for the day? I'd be delighted to do that. And help Maybe. with, uh, I will, uh, call roll. Call the roll. Roll call. Mike Alley, present. Uh, Dennis Bland. Present. John Costas. Present. Judd Fisher. Here. Colleen Gaphart. Present. Lisa Hirschman. Al Hubbard. Uh, Chris Lamothe. Uh, Chris Murphy, I think he will be calling in if he hasn't called in. Do we have our folks on the phone? I'm here, Beth. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, and we'll check back when, uh, possibly we'll have Chris a little later. Uh, Kathy Parkinson. Here. Uh, Bev Pitts, thank you, we've got you. Uh, John Pope. Here. And Alfonso Vidal. Um, Chris Murphy. Okay, Chris yeah. Murphy. Thank you very much, Chris. So, uh, Mr. Chair, we do indeed have a uh, quorum, and we Excellent. may proceed. Thank you very much. Um, and just so everybody's aware, we are uh, going to ask a favor. It's not a big one, but we're going to flip our order a little bit today. We have a couple of folks that need to leave early, and we have just barely a quorum. Um, so f we are going to flip our um, business items to the front end of this and then do public square. We don't have a long list of, pub of business items today, so it shouldn't throw us off much by any but appreciate everybody's understanding on that. Uh, the remarks I would like to make really are as much as any 
anything, just to draw your attention um, to a couple of events that are coming up that I hopefully you all have on your calendars, but if not, want to make sure uh, that they are on your calendars. They're very important annual events that we are a part of, and uh, number one is the State of the Higher Education Address that Commissioner Lubbers presents, and that will be held in the afternoon, late afternoon of April 8th, and then our annual Kent Weldon Conference for Higher Education, which will be held on the 9th, um, which this year is focused on addressing the transition from high school to college and careers. I uh, want to call your attention to that, and I think, Liz, all the information around, and Joan, all the information around uh, those programs uh, and those events are on the website. So uh, with that, that's about the extent of what I had to report on today. Commissioner Lubbers uh, is not here, uh, as I mentioned, and so we're going to defer a report uh, on from her at this point in time to next month. Um, you will note then uh, a couple of business items. The first is to approve the minutes from the February 14th Valentine's Day Commission meeting, uh, which are in your book. And I would entertain a motion for approval of I'm those minutes. I motion. I don't think I've ever managed to make it on the motion. Nice work. <laughs> You better, you better do a bunch of them here in the next couple of months. I think I could. <laughs> All right, so thank you, Kathy. Can I have a second? John, thank you. Are there any comments or questions or corrections on those minutes? Hearing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same? Aye. Very good, thank you. That was an aye in, in <laughs> support and not opposition, right, Bev? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I jumped too quickly. All right. So uh, first up on our business item list is uh, we have uh, one program uh, for approval for expedited action. As you will read in your document, it's the Master of Science in Speech Language Pathology to be offered by Purdue University Fort Wayne. The details uh, are on your agenda book, page 9. I would entertain a motion for approval of that expedited item. So moved. Thank you, Chris. Second. Hello. Yep. Second from yes. Dennis. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Any comments or questions on that expedited item? Hearing none, all in favor uh, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. Congratulations. That's approved. Uh, we have one uh, capital item for full discussion on the agenda today, and that is, as we mentioned this morning, the Purdue University West Lafayette uh, Purdue Union Club Hotel Renovation Project, beginning on page 11 of your book. Uh, Tony, I'd like to invite Tony Hahn up, who's the Director of State Relations and Policy Analysis uh, from Purdue, to present on the project. So, Tony, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I am Tony Hahn with Purdue, and I have one project for you to discuss today. It is a highly visible project on our West Lafayette campus, and one that I think you all can vouch for our need for renovation. This is the Purdue Memorial Union Club Hotel renovation. It's the same hotel that you stay in when you visit our campus. Uh, it was built in phases from 1929 to 1953, and uh, is in need of some freshening up and maybe some redesign. So we plan to renovate uh, 89,000 square feet of hotel guest room and lobby space that would include the creation of a new 8,500 square feet restaurant, bar, and cafe. We'll also upgrade some ballrooms and bathrooms that are in the union itself uh, and uh, upgrade those finishes and some plumbing and electrical behind the walls, uh, paint and some mill work. We have a very aggressive timeline. We, we plan to close the entire hotel on June 3rd of this year and then reopen in August of 2020 for uh, the new school year in 20 and take guests that August. We currently have 192 rooms in the hotel. We'll lose about 10 rooms to reconfiguration of size and the growth of more suite style rooms as well as a new open lobby and the restaurant. Uh, consistent with what it is today, the hotel and the new restaurant will serve as a living laboratory for our hospitality and tourism management students as those will be both managed and run as student programs. 
the total cost is $35 million, and it's all secured by gift funds. Uh, we had a very generous $30 million donation from uh, the White, the Dean and Bar 15 million from the Dean and Barbara White Family Foundation, and another 15 million from Bruce and Elizabeth White. Uh, and the other five are to be raised. So completely gift funded project that will make, uh, they'll be very impactful to our, to our hotel and one that uh, we'll be able to stay in the next time that we're on campus for commission meeting. Could I move approval with the special thank you to the whites for those of us that stay there every now and then? <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Duly noted. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, well, let, hold on one second. We'll, uh, I think we need to hear from Alicia Nafziger uh, with the uh, staff comments, and then I would invite any questions of either of them after that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Um, as Tony mentioned, this project is funded with gift funds and it's in line with other comparables. And as he mentioned, we stayed there last fall and we're looking forward to seeing the recommendations. So staff recommends approval for this project. Okay, very good. Now we have a, we have a motion on the table. Thank you, Chris, with the one addendum of thanks to the White family. John, I believe, seconded, right? Correct. So now, uh, comments, questions uh, for either Tony, Alicia, or anyone else? That's my kind of uh, funding. I like it. <laughs> I, I knew you would appreciate <laughs> that. Like <laughs> tell, tell, us, tell us about the White family. Uh, you've probably stayed in some other hotels of theirs. Uh, that's white family lodge or white, white lodging. lodging. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I see. Of the JW Marriott here downtown and, and some others. He started in the sign business, the roadside sign business, and then started in the hotel business in Maryville, Indiana, uh, with a holiday uh, property. And Interesting. And I think that's, that's still where they're based, right? The, yeah, or yeah, it's still where the headquarters is, and actually the sign business really the, the cash cow in the beginning, and then they started the hotel business and built a very good hotel business, sold it, and then Bruce has uh, built it again and sold it and built it again. And is a Bruce uh, alone? Yes, uh, and, and was a trustee of ours. And I'd like to say, too, um, to be fair, they've been very generous to our Northwest campus as well. We have a, a well-renowned hospitality program up there, and they've donated some space in a, another living laboratory on our Northwest campus that provides uh, much needed uh, labor for that space in the, in the Chicago land area. Tony has assured us that he will uh, shorten the length of the hallways. <laughs> and I, I, I've never been in a hotel that has longer hallways and, and, and than that they, hotel. They will be riddled with 90 degree corners, and, and I'm sure. <laughs> very, very linear, we'll, but I'm sure it'll, it'll We'll try to shorten your ways. stay, yeah. It's all to help in your, your quest for health. You're getting your steps. <laughs> that's, that's right. Oh, it's there you quest go. for health. All right, any other comments or Thank questions? Mr. Chairman, I, I, it's Alfonso here on the line. I just want to make sure that uh, you guys knew that I'm in. Oh, Alfonso, welcome. We're good. Excellent. We're good. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, welcome. Okay, any other comments, questions? All right, hearing none, all in favor of approval of the new uh, Purdue Union Club Hotel Renovation Project uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed, same sign? Okay, wonderful, congratulations, and do pass along congratulations to the entire Purdue crowd, as well as to the White family, our thanks. I will, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have, now we have two uh, capital projects for expedited action. Uh, those are the Purdue, it's uh, Purdue Day, uh, Purdue University West Lafayette, the Union University Church purchase, and Purdue University Fort Wayne, uh, the Park 3000 purchase. Uh, those two projects are uh, listed beginning on page 19 of your uh, agenda book. I would entertain a motion for appro approval of those two expedited actions. Uh -huh. Okay, thank second. you. Got a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on those? <clears throat> Okay, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, wonderful. Congratulations, Those are, that's the extent of our uh, business items today, so uh, nice, and, nice and quick and efficient. So for anybody who needs to, I know uh, Colleen needs to depart early, but anybody else who needs to slide out of here, 
especially with crazy weather. Uh, John, uh, since you flew, uh, whenever you need to. Thank you all very much for being here. All right, we will now move to our public square uh, item. And today's topic in our public square is the navigation, navigating college and careers. Um, and as, uh, as the commission has continued to engage in conversations around helping students navigate through college and careers, uh, we'll have the opportunity today to hear from Jennifer, or Jen as I understand it, uh, she goes by, Jen Statham, who is the Vice President uh, for Policy and Research at Achieve. Achieve's a nonprofit education reform organization based in New York, and it's dedicated to working with states to raise academic standards and graduation uh, requirements, among other priorities. Jen has a presentation planned for us today that's right in line with this theme and also uh, in line with the theme for our Weldon Conference coming up next month. She'll be sharing some of Achieve's work uh, around aligning high school graduation and college admission requirements. And she'll be helping explain how Indiana fits into the national landscape. And I just from memory, I believe Indiana's had a long history actually of working with Achieve going back many, many years. So uh, I'm sure you'll touch on that as well. So I will turn the floor over directly to Jen and welcome her. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm on the microphone, but I'm going to assume. Yeah, you want to okay. keep that mic kind of close. Okay. So that okay. Folks on Very. The floor. Okay, good. <laughs> Glad everyone can hear. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to speak this afternoon. As you uh, mentioned, Achieve does have a long history of working with the state of Indiana. Um, we often point to some of Indiana's policies and uh, policy structures um, as good examples of how states can promote uh, college and career ready uh, pathways for students. Uh, we also uh, like to highlight the uh, progress that the state has made um, to provide a lot of data and transparency around student outcomes. Um, this morning's uh, presentation on the college uh, readiness reports uh, is a really good example of the types of data uh, that we like to highlight that it should be available to students and parents. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, college and career readiness and system alignment, especially uh, within the context of state graduation requirements. Um, state graduation requirements are um, powerful levers in um, increasing the number and diversity of students who complete more rigorous and college and career ready aligned um, courses of study. So. Um, First, um, you know, this morning um, in in Sean's presentation, he talked a little bit about Indiana's uh, current rates of uh, remediation. Um, nationally, what we've seen um, overall is that um, high school graduation rates have continued to rise, both in Indiana and across the country. Since 2011, the national graduation rate has increased every I'm year. I'm sorry, but the speaker's oh. cutting out a little bit. Sorry. Um, nationally, uh, the uh, high school graduation rate has increased every single year, but we haven't seen uh, the same corresponding increase increase in college ready uh, outcomes and remediation is a really good um, example of that. I think it's important though to highlight, since I am in Indiana, that Indiana is an exception to this rule. Um, you have seen decreases in the percentage of students who enter college and need remediation, but overall nationally that has not always been the case. Um, so um, remediation rates are, um, they're generally flat um, in most places. Uh, in, in, in the slide deck we have here that 52% of students who are entering two-year schools need remediation in math and 34% um, need remediation in English language arts. Um, we have not seen um, increases in 12th grade NAEP scores in um, reading or math um, and we also haven't seen significant increases in the college readiness rates on the ACT or SAT. Um, and this is important because we know, um, I think you've heard uh, many times before, that the students who enter college in need of remediation are much less likely to actually complete a degree. 
Um, and that matters also because uh, it has some pretty big implications for um, the local and uh, state economies. I think um, just recently, I was last week, the Third Way, a national organization, published a report. And what they did was they did an analysis to see what would happen um, if the college graduation rate were the same as the high school graduation rate. Nationally, that, that's at 84%. So for just one graduating class, they estimated that there would be um, 1.3 million more college degree holders that would increase the number of individuals in the workforce, decrease the number of individuals and families in poverty. Um, we do know that on, you know, on average, degree holders um, earn more. It's about $4,800 more a year for two-year degree holders and $19,000 more a year for those um, who, uh, who receive a four-year degree. Um, and when you add that up over the course of their lifetime, that increase in graduation rates for that single um, class of graduates would uh, be an increase of more than $90 billion in local, state, and federal tax revenue. So college completion uh, really matters both for individuals but also for state and local economies as well. So we started to ask some questions, um, and, and Achieve has a long history of working on state graduation requirements and tracking state policies over time, but the question is really about how, what can states do to prepare more students? How can states better align their systems? And so we started to um, dig a little bit more deeply um, in state uh, changes to graduation rates, or graduation requirements over the last couple of years. Um, a lot of states are moving to a system of offering multiple pathways and different um, options for students to graduate from high school. And um, so that leads to the question of what is a pathway. This term, um, I will use it in a couple of different ways probably, that are somewhat different than what Indiana uses, and that's just a function of the fact that uh, pathways mean something different in every single state. Um, and people have been using it very differently, especially within the last couple of years, making it a pretty complicated term in some cases, and we're complicating the graduation requirements landscape at the same time as we're adding a whole lot more um, requirements for students. At the same time, we're also trying to add flexibility into the system. So, um, you know, I just wanted to sort of put out there the pathways means different things. Um, it's in some cases a state might have a single discrete diploma, for example, Delaware State, you know, diploma, um, and then they might have multiple ways, um, multiple pathways for students to pursue in order to get that single diploma. Other diplomas like Indiana might have multiple diplomas like the general diploma and the core 40 diploma and the core 40 with advanced and technical honors. Um, and they often have different sets of requirements. Historically, pathways have, have often been referred to as a defined set of career and technical education pathways. There's a number of organizations that have worked to really clearly define what those CTE pathways are for students. And then in some cases, it's just multiple variations of the above. Um, they do a lot of different things. Um, and so pathways just mean something different in a lot of places. And so I'm going to try and refer to it here today as what it means for a student to go through high school and follow that pathway to the diploma. And then in some cases, when it comes to diplomas, we've been referring to them as diploma options for students because they are multiple options. Um, so, so with all that said and how confusing that um, can be at times, uh, the structure of high school graduation requirements do matter. Um, about six months ago, Achieve uh, released a, a data tool online um, on our website that has uh, the state graduation requirements in every state and all of those different diploma options. Um, so you can go and explore those. Nationally, there are more than 100 different um, high school graduation options 
options for students. A majority of states, 29 of them, now offer more than one option for students to graduate. Some states have upwards of five different options for students in terms of formal <coughs> um, diplomas. Um, where it becomes really uh, important is how states um, report that information. 10 of the 29 states that offer multiple diplomas um, report that information by different diploma type. Indiana is one of those states. Uh, Indiana is also one of the seven out of that 10 who report the information by student subgroup. So we, in those 10 states, and specifically those seven, we get a lot of information about which students are graduating under which pathway, which is important because we want to be able to understand whether or not some students are disproportionately put into uh, less rigorous pathways. Um, and then the other uh, important finding from our work over the last couple of months is it sounds really obvious when you say it, but um, when you define, a, we defined a default diploma as that pathway that if a student enters ninth grade and does nothing and just does what's expected of them or what their college counselor advises them to do, that's the diploma that they would get at the end of the day without doing anything else. Um, and that default pathway in Indiana has traditionally been the core 40, and we define it as a college and career ready course of study. And in those states where the students enter into a default pathway that is aligned to college and career readiness, you have more students who complete a college and career ready course of study. Seems very obvious, but when you look at it, um, there are some states who um, require students to make a choice to enter into that more rigorous pathway. And in states like Indiana, and this is one of the policy structures that we highlight for the state of Indiana and where we believe more states should follow your lead is ensuring that all students are defaulted into a college and career ready course of study. Because if you look at the data in those seven states that provide that information, um, more students, especially more students who are black and Hispanic and low income will complete a college and career ready course of study. And Indiana's um, data I pulled um, from the college readiness report from 2016. You can see this, um, how the high school course requirements in that pathway through high school uh, really impact students. Um, the percentage of um, students who enter college is significantly higher for students who receive the honors diploma and the core 40 diploma. And then of course, the remediation rates as well are uh, much lower for those students who receive the honors mm -hmm. and the core 40. The economy, the economy and oh. There we go. Um, so then the uh, next question that we asked was, how do high school graduation requirements compare to college admissions requirements? Um, these, they're both really important signals to students and families about what it means to be ready to enter college. Um, and this information is also on the same website, it's highschool.achieve.org. Um, on the website, what we did was we looked at all of the high school graduation requirements um, in those 50 states, and then we focused on the math and science requirements for public four-year um, institutions in each state that serve some of the highest populations of first-time in-state students. And so we looked at a total of 98 institutions. There are uh, two states who uh, only have one public four-year institution that reports admissions requirements in a way that's very explicit, and then DC does not have a four-year um, public institution. And so um, I'm going to start by just talking about it from a national perspective, and then I'll provide you the analysis for some of the institutions in Indiana. I'm sure that's what you're most interested in. But um, right now, in over half of states, for that default pathway, the one that students automatically enter into in high school, uh, in 29 states completing that default uh, pathway in math, those graduation requirements do not uh, necessarily prepare students for post-secondary admission. In 
um, science, it's 24 states where if you go into that default pathway, you do not necessarily meet the entrance admissions requirements for the post-secondary institution in the state. Okay, so um, when, we, when we looked at the requirements and how they differed, how the graduation requirements and the college admissions requirements differed, they most often differ in the number of courses required, three years versus four years in most cases, the specificity of the courses and the language in those requirements, and then also whether or not there is more advanced coursework required by the post-secondary institution. Um, just to give you some context of where the institutions fall nationally, of the 98 uh, institutions we looked at, 63 require three years of math, 35 require four years of math. Um, and then in terms of content, that 73 of those institutions require Algebra 2 or equivalent, um, or two years of algebra. And 20 of those 73 institutions actually require a course beyond Algebra 2. In science, um, it, the most common is for um, to require three years of science courses. A small number require four, um, and just 22 require two science courses. Uh, and then the content of the courses um, in 65 of those institutions, there's a they specify lab science, which turns out to be sometimes a real um, discrepancy between the high school graduation requirements and post secondary. Sometimes high school just doesn't. Uh, specify whether or not lab science is required for students. And then we also asked this question about computer science. This is a topic that's been of real interest uh, in high schools and in colleges. And of the 98 institutions we look at, a handful of them do specify um, and allow computer science to count towards admissions requirements. Four of them allow it to count towards science, three math, one math or science, and then five allow it to count towards foreign language or elective credits. <laughs> <laughs> Computer science can be sometimes a foreign language. <laughs> it is a way of thinking. I, I understand why they think that. <laughs> um, Do you speak binary? <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> um, and so before we get into the specifics on graduation um, requirements and admissions requirements in Indiana, just want to um, talk a little bit about the graduation pathways in Indiana, uh, the, the new requirements for the class of 2023 um, that are really focused on getting students the strong foundational um, knowledge and, and academic and technical skills, the employability skills and experience with um, career interests and options for students. Um, the new graduation pathways uh, still require that a student earn a high school diploma. Um, and so the general diploma, the core 40, are the academic honors and technical honors. Um, the pathway uh, that students um, have in employability skills includes one of the um, either a project-based learning experience, a service-based learning experience, or a work-based learning experience. And then demonstrating post-secondary ready competencies. I didn't list the whole uh, list of options that students have there, but it's a number of different um, college ready assessments um, or other benchmarks that are, are readiness indicators of um, career readiness, either a credential or apprenticeship or other CTE type of program. Um, when we looked at our analysis of um, Indiana institutions and graduation requirements, we looked at high school course requirements for graduation because, again, the students still need to meet that um, and to attain a high school diploma. And so those course requirements are really what matters for students. Um, so 
Our website um, has two institutions on it. We looked at Indiana University of Bloomington and Purdue for our main analysis, um, but we added a couple more um, before I came today. And so um, if you look at the slide, essentially what this means, um, from left to right, we have the general diploma. And does do the requirements of the general diploma make a student eligible for admission? Uh, the next column is the core four diploma. The third column is the core 40 with academic honors and then the last column is core 40 with technical honors. Uh, the green check mark means that they are in alignment, that the graduation requirements are aligned with the course requirements that are outlined in the post-secondary uh, institutions admissions requirements. The X means that that is not the case um, and yellow just means that it's a maybe and so for example example, Indiana University at Bloomington um, requires a fourth year of math and there's a list of options in math courses that a student may take and some of the courses on that list um, are not necessarily um, aligned with what um, or some of the the requirements that students may choose from are not necessarily aligned to the what the university requires. So a student could choose a course in math and not end up with um, meeting that fourth year math requirement that Indiana University at Bloomington requires. Can we ask questions while you're talking? Sure. Um, so that means that IU and Purdue uh, do not consider the core 40 uh, making the student eligible? Yeah, in um, some cases, and I can um, look at this information, n if I can guess, um, and I can't confirm, I might have to look at my notes, but what it is in math generally is that the core 40 requires four years of math, um, but the higher ed institution specifies that it needs to, that they need to take a year beyond algebra two, and they specify pre-calculus, trigonometry, or calculus. And in, so a student in high school may take a fourth year of math without actually taking one of those three yeah. courses. Okay. So what happens when they, uh, that did, do they have to, uh, they don't have to remediate if you're at core 40. So. Yeah, the, the question is, you the know. Question, it's not whether you get admitted, it's whether they think you're re ready, that those courses really prepare you. I, that's the question. Yeah, and in some, yeah, I think that some institutions may have a process in which they consider those, um, but the way that the language is specified on the admissions requirements website um, is not that. It, it specifies specific courses, and so that's how we made the judgment. But that doesn't mean that in the admissions process they, they don't make do yeah. Might. They might not. They might not. Uh. And so, when you look at when you look at science, there is um, a bit more alignment, um, and all of the core forty requirements um, do line up with.